Today we're continuing with the Reformation, focused on the English Reformation, uh, which is important for all kinds of reasons, not only because the British Empire will spread to the known world, uh, it'll also have a big impact on our own nation's history. Uh, So before diving into that, let's pray together. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for this day, a chance to think about these things. Please refresh us with your presence today in worship. Please inspire our minds and hearts through studying history of your people. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so uh, much of what goes on in England will be uh, concurrent with stuff we've already looked at, stuff happening in Germany, stuff happening in Geneva. Last week, of course, we focused on John Calvin in Geneva and um, the Reformation there, kind of the Swiss Reformation. Geneva becomes an important Protestant city, and it's where many Protestant uh, uh, exiles will have to flee uh, to, for protection, and including John Knox, who then you know, later goes back and starts the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. Um, so the Scottish Reformation is very much influenced by Geneva and Calvin, right? The church in England, its Reformation is going to have influences from both Geneva and Wittenberg, that is both from Germany and the, the Swiss-French uh, Revolution. But let's talk about, I mean, the story happens differently there, right? It's not just about kind of one Luther-like figure who emerges and challenges the authorities and then starts this new movement. It actually starts at the very top with Henry VIII, right? So Henry VIII, King of England in the early part of the uh, 1500s, he finds himself facing a dilemma. Henry VIII, right, is uh, he's actually considers himself to be a faithful son of the church. He is Roman Catholic through and through. He does not like what he hears about the Reformation happening down on the European continent. He has no interest in that. But what makes him start to have an interest in doing something new is that he needs a male heir, right? And he's married to a woman named Catherine, who um, they do have a child named Mary, but they don't have a male heir. And Catherine had previously been Henry's, Henry's brother's wife. And so he kind of had this sort of dilemma already that maybe he shouldn't have taken her to be his wife. And since he needs a male heir, he's thinking this could be a convenient moment to get that marriage annulled. Never mind that he's already been uh, spending time with another woman named Anne Boleyn, right? <laughs> Uh, So he writes to the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, and asks for an annulment of his previous marriage so that he can marry Anne Boleyn. And the Pope says, no, (laughs) you can't have that. One of the reasons the Pope says no is that Catherine is related to the Holy Roman Emperor. All right. And he does not want to, the Pope does not want to upset the Holy Roman Emperor. And so he's not going to offend him by disgracing his relative, Queen Catherine, right? It, it's all related. You know, everybody in Europe is sort of related somehow. <laughs> it feels like in the leadership at this time. So Henry decides uh, the only way that he's going to be able to divorce Catherine and marry Anne Boleyn is to separate from Rome. And so eventually, Henry will declare himself to be the head of the church in England and make an official break with Rome. Now, the, the connection between England and Rome has been there since about 600, 8600. So we're, it's like 900 years of Christian history in England that's Catholic, all right? But as we said before, when we were studying these things, that there was, a, there was Christianity in England before the Roman Catholics ever got there, right? The Celtic Christianity. And so Henry thinks he has precedent it's to say, hey, the church existed here on the British Isles, before Rome ever sent uh, a guy named, confusingly, Augustine of Canterbury to become their uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. So he says, we can do that again. We can go back to being our own church. So this idea of a national church separate from Rome in Western Christendom is really a, a new sort of idea, right? So Henry makes that break, declaring himself to be head of the church. But... This, it is not a Protestant church at this point. This is a, a reformation only of like state head. 
not of, of theology, not yet. Henry is still Catholic in all of his beliefs, officially, <laughs> if not in practice, because uh, as you know, things will continue to go poorly for Henry, and Anne Boleyn will have a child, but it's a, a female again. This will be Elizabeth, uh, and she's not producing a male heir, you know, as, as far as Henry's concerned, and so he's going to be rid of her through beheading at one point, marry someone else. Jane Seymour, thinks number three. Uh, and then there's going to be a couple more Catherines and another Anne, you know, before Henry is finished. But uh, he does actually get a male heir from Jane Seymour, and that's Edward VI. So to make a long story short, after Henry dies, Edward becomes king, but Edward's just a kid. And so being just a kid, there's not much that he can do, but he has a bunch of stewards around him, you know. And those stewards happen to be influenced by the Protestant Reformation. Uh, among them is this guy named Thomas Cranmer, who is the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, he was Henry's Archbishop, but Thomas was, is not like a Luther figure. He's very much like holding his position close to the vest. You know, uh, mostly because Henry kills people he doesn't like, you know, or who offend him. And so Thomas is kind of motivated to... <coughs> Do things slowly, quietly, calmly, you know. Like, for instance, Cranmer is married, but under Henry, that was not permitted, right? A Catholic priest can't be married. And so Grant Cranmer had to keep his wife hidden um, while Henry was alive. But after Henry dies, you know, then that can become public. So under Edward's rule, the country starts to move in this Protestant direction accepting some of the theological views of the Lutherans and the Calvinists. Um, but since Edward is a sickly young man, he doesn't live very long, and so that Protestant influence only can, can only go so far. All right? But it is him who's taking this Church of England in the Protestant direction. Sadly, after he dies, you know the story, Mary Tudor becomes the monarch. Mary is Henry's daughter from Catherine, his first wife. She is thoroughly Catholic. <coughs> Catherine, Catherine was Spanish. All of Spain is, is Catholic you know, at the time. And so Mary decides to take the church back to Rome. She submits again uh, the, herself and all the churches of England back to the Bishop of Rome, back to the Pope, puts archbishops in place who are Roman Catholic in England, and starts to persecute any, any of those who object, right? So we know her in history as Bloody Mary, right? Uh, responsible for putting to death something like 300 Protestant leaders, including Thomas Cranmer and a, a host of other uh, leaders at the time. Cranmer's story in and of itself is interesting. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it in just a second, but uh, if you want, you can read a, a whole big book just about Thomas Cranmer and his story. This is a uh, an award-winning uh, biography by a guy named Darman McCulloch. Uh, Darman McCulloch is not a Christian. He's just an Oxford historian, and he's, he writes a lot about the history of the church. So his perspective is interesting, but we read it critically. Okay, so uh, Mary Tudor, she's take, making it Catholic again. After Mary dies, not, and having had no children, the next of Henry's children becomes the monarch. Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth I. Queen Elizabeth I is star because she is probably the most famous monarch in British history, at least uh, in the modern era, or like that is post medieval times. She definitely takes the, the church back in this Protestant direction. Under uh, Elizabeth, they, they call it the Elizabethan settlement. Have you heard this phrase before? It's the idea that she, she doesn't want her subjects fighting anymore. Um, like the Catholics and the Protestants. And she basically comes down saying like, look, we're going to be a Protestant church accepting the Protestant theology while retaining much of the medieval Catholic forms. So she retains bishops and many other forms, but takes back, there's an act of uniformity at the time where uh, Elizabeth is declared to be the supreme governor of the church. That actually slightly changes the title where Henry declared himself the supreme head of the church she says she's the supreme governor of the church where Christ alone is the head. Are they all dying fairly young? 
Uh, yes, fairly young. I mean, uh, Mary's older, uh, but is unable to have children. Elizabeth's only 25 when she becomes queen, and she will reign for 43 years. Uh, 44 years, I think. As a result, when someone reigns a long time, they're able to kind of bring uh, kind of established stuff, you know, settle things. The, when there's constant change in monarchs, you know, that's just a, a upheaval, chaotic times, you know, where the country's going to shift back and forth, you know, one way or the other. Uh, but being able to reign for a long time, she's able to establish many things and really to establish what we think of today as the Church of England or the Anglican Church. All right. Uh, sometimes Anglicanism is seen as a kind of middle way between Protestantism and Catholicism, mostly because it looks Catholic, but its beliefs are Protestant. All right. And that's an important distinction. Uh, some people refer to the Anglican Church, at, uh, some Anglicans themselves will say they are Reformed Catholics, Reformed with a like, lowercase c. So they've Reformed the Church from the medieval period, but basically kept the cathedrals, like I said, the bishops, and all the other forms. So if, even today, if you go to an Anglican service, which uses the Book of Church Order as its liturgy, it would feel similar to if you, had gone, if you went to a Catholic church. Like the liturgy would be similar. You kind of know what to expect. You know? There's going to be these readings. There'll be a short homily. There'll be the altar or with communion at the end of the service. Um, we'll all say the creed. We'll all pray the Lord's Prayer. You know, it's like similar liturgies. It reminds me of last year I was <laughs> listening to Beth Moore's autobiography, her memoir, and she talks about her and her husband going to visit an Anglican church, and um, he grew up Catholic, and so as they go visit this church, he like knows what to do, just instinctively, like knows when to kneel, when to stand. He's like reciting the creed, and she, you know, they've been Southern Baptists for like 35 years at this point, and so she, she, when she writes about it, she says she's looking at him going, who are you? How do you know what to do, you know, in this service? And he wasn't even thinking about it, just grew up in the Catholic church, kind of knew how to, uh, how to be. Um, but if you ask Anglicans, I mean, they're going to insist that the theology is Protestant. It's basically Calvinist. Um, the doctrinal standards of the Anglican church are Calvinist in nature. Uh, and we'll talk about those in just a second. Elizabeth is famous for other reasons. Uh, she was said that she's called the Virgin Queen. She never married, um, which obviously produced the problem of an heir. Like there was going to be no heir in the Tudor family uh, after her. Uh, she also did not want to share power with a man. You know? And she kind of learned from Mary's experience that bringing in, a, especially bringing in a foreigner, because, you know, often princes and princesses marry each other from other countries, you know, at the time. She's like, if you're not going to bring in a foreigner to rule over the English people or to share power <laughs> with. And so she's remembered as the Virgin Queen, Good Queen Bess. You know. <laughs> um, one of the things she's famous for is the defeat of the Spanish Armada. You know this story? Uh, so Spain is thoroughly Catholic, and they're developing a navy, right? And the, the British Navy is not is nothing is not bad, it's, and it's not even that much smaller. Uh, but the Spanish intend to send the Armada to to take over England, and she's able to fight them off. And actually, she prevents this uh, rendezvous. Like the Armada was going to unite with land forces and be able to thoroughly invade England and probably take it over, which would have turned it back to the Catholic Church, right? Well, she, they're able to defeat the Spanish Armada, which establishes Elizabeth as a strong monarch, and it establishes England as a forever Protestant country. It also means that Western Christendom would never be united. It would always be both Protestant and Catholic. You know, if the, Span, if the Spanish are able to take over everything, they can turn everybody back to the Catholic Church. You know, uh, but they don't. Remember, this is the age of expansion, so Spain is sending explorers out to North and South America, and England is sending people to North and South America, and the French are sending people to North and South America. You know that most of North America was actually controlled by the Spanish and the French for a long time before the English ever get colonies established, and it very much could have gone that way, and these could have been Catholic nations that were established. Um, instead, the English colonies are the ones that are going to you know, get established later on. In fact, Virginia, 
uh, is named after Queen Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. That's where it was established as an Anglican colony. George Washington is Anglican, you know, <laughs> worships in the, the Anglican church there. Uh, so, I mean, there's so much more we can, we can say about these. I'm trying to pick the best details. Um, questions so far at this point? So over in America, North America yeah. right now, everybody's just kind of... Exploring. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You don't, it's right. You don't, you know, and just like claiming large swaths of land, especially French and Spanish. They're just claiming, you know... Yeah. Spiritual other than the Indians. That's right. The Native Americans are, Native of course, there. Uh, and the, they're bringing Catholicism, the Spanish and the French. Right? Okay. Whereas the, there's not an English settlement yet. I mean, um, Jamestown is, what, 1605 or something like that? So we haven't even gotten to Jamestown yet you know, in history. Uh, you would have had Roanoke, but it disappears. You know, you know their story. Mm -hmm. We will be getting into, I mean, that is highlighting the significance of looking at the English Reformation is because of the impact it will have on North America and the establishing of the colonies later on. And the British Empire will spread the Church of England to the world so that today the Anglican Church is the third largest Christian body on the planet. Uh, behind Roman Catholics are the largest, Eastern Orthodox are the second, and Anglicans are the third largest body. There's 80 million Anglicans in the world, and most of them are African or Asian, which is weird. You know, it's like how <laughs> you're the Church of England is mostly African and Asians. <laughs> you know, it's just it's wild. Like, there's more Christians, there's more uh, Anglicans in uh, Rwanda than there is in uh, England. You know, the Church of England's a mixed bag. You know, they, they, there's evangelicals um, in the Church of England, and then there's you know, kind of very socially liberal. Uh, Leaders in the church. Of England. Yeah, just like it is everywhere in the West. I mean, <laughs> I think something like fifteen to twenty percent of British people go to an Anglican church, you know, and only twenty percent of people in the United States go to church too. So it's about the same. Yeah, so it's it's very similar to the mainline churches in the U.S., you know, which have been in decline for years. <clears throat> uh, but they they have their exceptions, just like just like we do. So let's see, what else do I want to say? So one of the things you have in England, it's important to understand, is that the church is an established church. The monarch is head of the state and head of the church. And that's still true today. Um, all of English history is so wrapped up with the church that it's impossible for them to conceive or, or work out a kind of separation of church and state. So like when you get to the Amer North American colonies and they're interested in having a non-establishment clause... It's in large part response to the English tradition of having an established church. Right? So that is to say England is officially a Christian empire, at least on paper. All ministers since the time of the Reformation take an oath of allegiance to the monarch. Um, which is why Anglicanism actually dies in the United States after the Revolutionary War. Uh, because you can't have people making... Vows of loyalty to the King of England, you know, when after the American Revolution, so Anglicanism dies and it's reborn as the Episcopal Church in the United States. And so the Episcopal Church is Anglicanism; it's just now separated from the British monarch. That makes sense, uh, but it's still continuing that tradition. Elizabeth is fairly gracious to the Catholics in uh, in England. She's not interested in. Uh, the same kind of persecution, like in reverse, that Mary had done. She's not interested in that. She actually wants them all to stop fighting. Uh, and it's one of the ways that she asserts herself. And over time, like, you know, the, the kind of respect Queen Elizabeth II had in England as she grew older. It's like, certainly she lived through scandals and such. But she's the, the longest reigning monarch in British history, the Queen Elizabeth II, who just died recently. Um, but the kind of pop popularity she has among the public, that's what Elizabeth I also had. Um, and so people like her and people respect her. And in some ways she could uh, get away with things. Like uh, she could tell the bishops to behave, basically, and make them do so. You know, and they honored her as such. Uh, of course, there were churchmen who thought it wasn't right for a woman to be the monarch of England. Uh, but they had no 
choice about it. <laughs> like no, no recourse. Over time, people tended to accept it. And Queen Elizabeth II may very well have been the last Christian monarch to, <laughs> like authentically Christian monarch to be involved in, as head of the church. I don't know about the rest of their family. You know, but if the crown is any indication, you know, <laughs> it's not encouraging. Right? We'll see. We'll see. There's hope yet. Uh, Cramer, let's talk about him because Cramer, if Elizabeth is going to establish the Church of England as a Protestant church as the head of state, Cramer is the one who establishes it as a Protestant church theologically and devotionally. Uh, his work, like I said, is mostly quiet, but he has a long reign as Archbishop of Canterbury. He's the one who produces the Book of Common Prayer still in use today. I meant to bring my copy of that today. The Book of Common Prayer is just that. It is, does include lots of prayers on various subjects. It also includes the Eucharistic liturgy. That is, that is the normal Sunday service order of worship you know, that all Anglican churches use you know, with varying degrees of modification. It includes uh, morning and evening prayer liturgies. Actually, more than morning and evening. It has morning, noon, evening, and Compline, which is like late night prayer liturgies. You know what I mean by a liturgy? It's like giving you kind of an organizational flow to it. Like starts with this prayer of repentance and then this scripture reading and then this uh, you know, reciting the creed or reciting the Lord's Prayer or something like that. It includes things like the creeds, but then most of it is prayers for various occasions. All right? It's been updated a little bit here and there, but a lot of the prayers that he pulls together were ancient prayers. Like he's pulling stuff from resources we no longer have access to, like stuff from uh, early church fathers in their writings. He puts it all in the Book of Common Prayer. And so the Book of Common Prayer, many people still find it to be a rich devotional resource. Many Presbyterians even use the Book of Common Prayer. Um, I visited Red Mountain, Red Mountain Church in Birmingham, which is a PCA church, Presbyterian church. Um, it's a very similar church to Seven Hills. It meets downtown in an old theater, you know, and has a mission, you know, kind of for the city. Uh, but they have communion every Sunday, and they use the Book of Common Prayer as their liturgy for it. Uh, and that's interesting. He also writes the, the homilies. Uh, why is this important? So many Anglican clergy, at least at the beginning, coming out of Catholicism, didn't have the same kind of training uh, theological training that pastors would go on to have uh, later. And so he writes like kind of authorized sermons that can be preached in the churches. All right? And these authorized sermons are thoroughly Protestant in their theology. So they're talking about justification by faith, apart from works of the law, grace alone, emphasizing the work of Christ as opposed to like our works of merit or something like that. So it's, it's getting Protestant theology down into the lay level through these homilies. Got it? And you can still buy the homilies if you want online. You know, check them out. Um, but perhaps most importantly is he's, Thomas Cranmer writes 39 articles. 39 articles are the, uh, the theological standards for the Anglican Church in the same way that the Westminster Confession is for the Presbyterian Church. Right? But the 39 articles are a lot shorter. And it's... Uh, it's actually fewer in number. And originally there was 42. And they ended up cutting it down to 39. <laughs> and the 39 articles are very, uh, they're essentially Calvinist doctrine in, in their soteriology and how they talk about salvation. So it's still the doctrinal standards. In fact, uh, J.I. Packer says that the Westminster standards, which are written in the 1600s, are, are intended to be expositions of the 39 articles. Like they actually kind of have an organic connection to each other as like seed and flower. Uh, because as we're going to see next time in the English church, you always had this, you start, you had this struggle between the Presbyterians and the Anglicans uh, as to like what sort of church was, were you going to have in Britain? And it's going to have some English people that like the Presbyterian system better, which is going to be like, get rid of bishops Let's have this, the, this theology and then the Anglicans who were like, uh, you're a little too strident about that theology and we would like to keep our bishops. You know? <laughs> and so next time I'll talk about the interregnum, uh, Oliver Cromwell, and the, uh, that, those, that kind of story if you're familiar with it. But this establishes Anglican doctrine uh, up to the present. 
Uh, so Cranmer really is brilliant. I mean, he's, uh, I think he's Cambridge uh, trained and uh, eventually Oxford was, is going to become kind of thoroughly Protestantized, Angl- Anglicized, if you will. You find more Catholics still at Cambridge, but Oxford's pretty, very Anglican. Um, so did you say Cranmer was beheaded by Mary? He's actually burned at the stake by, by Mary. He has an interesting story. Like he's lived this long life at that, by that point. And he's made this big impact on the church. Everyone recognizes it. Um, but at first he's arrested by Mary's people and they pressure him to um, basically renounce his objections to Catholicism. And at first he's like, okay, that's what I'll do. But he's like, to save his life because he sees people being killed. And then um, shortly before, he, he, allows, he gets them to let him address the crowd. <laughs> and when he's a... Addressing the crowd, he, he, he renounces his renouncement, basically. <laughs> he says, uh, actually, I didn't mean it when I said I renounced my Protestant convictions. and I uphold them. And he says he had written this confession in, uh, out. And so he puts his hand into the fire. And he's like, this was the hand that offended. I'm gonna, it's going to burn first. Um, the place where he was burned, I think I mentioned this before, it's still there in Oxford in the middle of the street. There's a cobblestone cross in the middle of an otherwise busy road. And it's the place where he was burned at the stake. Just around the corner, there's something called the Martyr's Memorial. Have any of you been there or seen this before? Uh, the Martyr's Memorial is a big, cool-looking thing, and it's got uh, a guy named Ridley and Latimer and another and Cranmer like statues of them at the top. They were just Protestant English reformers who were killed by Mary. So, like I said, the Church of England will one day get exported around the world. And so Anglicanism is a global thing, not just a national British thing. Uh, there's two Anglican churches, in, uh, two, English, two like versions of Anglicanism in South Africa. Um, when I was there, I was freshly minted into the Anglican tradition. I got to go and speak at an Anglican church uh, there in Stellenbosch. Um, it was an English-speaking church because it, it's more prevalent among the mixed-race people there that they call colored in South Africa or mixed-race people. So that's lots of the Anglican churches are that kind of person. <laughs> um, okay. Now we need to talk briefly about the Counter-Reformation, but I just want to see what sort of questions are coming up for you related to English Reformation, any of these characters, the nature of Anglicanism as a whole. Anglicanism today kind of has its own, like, streams, just like every other denomination does. You know, know, um, they say Anglicanism has three streams. There's the Anglo-Catholic folks who really emphasize strict adherence to the liturgy, And you have evangelical Anglicans. These are people like C.S. Lewis, J.I. Packer, John Stott. You know, they're Bible-centered people, you know, uh, Bible and discipleship-oriented people. And then you have, there's a charismatic stream also within uh, Anglicanism. You don't, it's usually not manifested in church services. Like, they don't look like Pentecostal services. But most Anglican churches have prayer ministries. There's, like, officially consecrated oil that the bishop hands out to ministers every year for prayer, praying over people. and um, so There's that kind of charismatic push in it. Lots of healing prayer ministries, I should say. The, the, pre, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury um, today, you might know who it is today. Justin Welby is his name. Uh, before that was a guy named Rowan Williams. Rowan Williams is a rock star theologian. Um, He's since retired. And Welby's been Archbishop of Canterbury for about the last 10 years, I think. You probably heard me talk about N.T. Wright before. N.T. Wright is uh, an Anglican theologian. He would be in that evangelical stream I mentioned, you know, similar to Packer and Stott. Uh, You know J.I. Packer. I mean, our church is reading a book by him. uh, uh, You might not know John Stott. Does that name sound familiar to you? he was part, an ex, part of a, a kind of Church of England where they kind of move away from wearing the vestments and the robes and stuff and look more, I don't know, kind of like Presbyterians in some ways. You know? But what's a Presbyterian look like? I don't know. <laughs>
just not wearing the clergy collar and, you know, all that. So some of you might not know, I'm officially ordained in the Anglican Church. Um, they, it's the Anglican Church in North America. Um, I'm, I'm in that evangelical stream, for sure. But, which brings up a, an interesting point, right? <laughs> the relationship between Anglicans and Presbyterians. You know, it's, they're both British Isle reform movements. They're both English-speaking reform movements. So in, in some ways, uh, the, the English Reformation, or if we said the British Informa- Reformation, it would include both Scotland and England, right? Um, and both groups, both, but they're basically just national churches until they come to North America, and then they're living side by side at each other. Um, that's a, that's a ne- my next important point, is we've talked about Lutherans, uh, we've talked about Presbyterians and Reformed, we've talked about Anglicans. These are the original Protestants, all right? Um, and even though they are separate groups, they're very like-minded and unified. Um, these, are not, this, these are not like factions within the movement. They think of themselves more, of, more like uh, as national churches. Basically, if you're English and you're Christian, you, know, you kind of have a solidarity with other English. And if you're not going to be Catholic, you're going to be Anglican. If you're Scottish, you're either going to be Catholic or Presbyterian. German, you're either going to be Catholic or Lutheran. But the different reform movements share the same theology, so they're more or less <laughs> united. Okay? So you should think of those original Protestants not as splintering the church, because they see themselves as being on the same page, uh, more or less. It's just the Reformation in England is one way, in Scotland's another way, in Germany's another way. Okay? It doesn't start to feel divisive until all of those groups start having communities in North America, once again, and are living beside each other. Uh, now you've got, like, competition. <laughs> you don't really have the competition in the, in the host, in the country of origin. Does this make sense, what I'm saying? And um, there was something about the American ideal, especially the American frontier, which will cause all of those denominations to split, divide, into increasingly more and more groups. <coughs> Where did John Wesley, what was his origin? Yes, yeah, so Wesley's in the 1700s. We're going to get to him, too, because the Methodist movement comes out of the Church of England in the 1700s. And it was meant to be more like a streamlined version of Anglicanism, like a, a, a version that's accessible to the poor or people living out in the country. You know, That's why he travels to all over the place by horseback you know, to meet with these people. Wesley himself is an Anglican priest. And he was until the day he died. He didn't intend to start a new church. Uh, just a, a Methodism starts as a renewal movement within Anglicanism. This past week in our Bible study, we were reading uh, John 17 on campus. And you have the Jesus high priestly prayer about praying that all of his people would be one. And so a, a student asked rightly, you know, so does that mean that not all denominations are bad? You know, because it seems that we divided ourselves. I was like, well, sometimes that's the case and sometimes it's not. Like in the history of Christianity, not all denominations were intending to be divided from each other. You know, it was just the expression of their church in that country. Now, of course, later it does become more divisive, uh, especially when you have tons of options. And if you don't like them, you can just start your own, which is what happens (laughs) uh, in North America. It's also no established church. So if you have no established church... In North America, people are kind of free to start their own kind of church, you know, and do their own kind of thing. Because the government's not, not, not related to it, right? Um, one other thought I was going to... All Baptist churches also come out of the Church of England, uh, but that's in the 1600s. So we haven't quite gotten there yet. Uh, still get, we'll get to those things more in the next week or two. Uh, Baptists come out of the Church of England in the 1600s, and um, they basically have all the same views as Presbyterians, except the except on the question of baptism. Like the the first Baptist Confession of Faith is just the Westminster Confession edited in two or three places. You know, um, I'll say some some more about. I mean that the uh, interregnum period. Uh, it's this English Revolution kind of births this spirit of creating new churches. So you'll also get Quakers emerge out of the Church of England eventually. Um, 
Yeah, Baptists and Methodists. You know, Baptists and Methodists are, are really small movements until the 19th century. And in the 19th century, they spread like wildfire, mostly in North America. And once it spreads in North America, it can spread to the rest of the world. You know. Counter-Reformation in like five minutes, okay? <laughs> the Counter-Reformation is sort of like the Catholic response to all this stuff that's going on. What does the Catholic Church do, right? If, now, half the German people are leaving their churches. Uh, half the Swiss people are leaving their churches. All the English are gone. You know, <laughs> all the... All the Oh, Scottish are gone. Uh, what do they do? Um, are they going to just like sort of hunker down, uh, just go to war? Yes and yes. But there are actually positive things that happen in the Catholic Church as a result of the Reformation. Uh, one of those is that, remember how I said many people had been working for Reformation within the Catholic Church before Luther? Uh, and it finally sort of catches up with them. Uh, Pope Paul the Fourth. Brings, he, he's in the, he's Pope from 1555 to 1559. He uh, brings moral reform to the church. So the church cleans up its act, so to speak, on the moral issues that have been a problem. Remember, Luther has theological problems with the Catholic church, but also moral issues. When he visited Rome, he found they had brothels for clergy, you know. And so Rome cleans up its act morally, and they kind of get their ducks in a row theologically. And they do that at the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent lasts almost 20 years, like 20 years of gatherings uh, to hash out, okay, what are our beliefs? Because many Catholic beliefs, believe it or not, were not firmly established until the Protestant Reformation starts to question Catholic doctrine. And then they solidify it afterwards in response. So the Council of Trent becomes like that defining moment for Catholicism, just defining its theology. The uh, canons of Trent are still taught today in Catholic circles as this is our theology. In the same way we would use the Westminster Confession or something. They use the canons of Trent. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Um, they actually uh, look to Thomas Aquinas for leadership in that. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, of course, who had died uh, in the 12th century, uh, but whose writings, who had left this massive theological corpus behind, they began to kind of take their cues from him and say, all right, Thomas's theology is going to be our, our Catholic theology. You start to get renewal movements like the Jesuits. The Jesuits are a spiritual, like moral purity reform movement within Catholicism. It's happening at about the same time as the Reformation is happening in Europe. Uh, Ignatius Loyola, his whole story, you know, he's like, he's a soldier who gets wounded in battle. He's not a Christian. Um, while he's wounded in his convalescence, there's like two books in the room with him. And both of them are works from like Catholic mystics, medieval mystics. And he starts reading them and feels that he himself has a kind of vision of Jesus. And after this, pledges his life to be a part of this spiritual renewal movement within Catholicism. And now Jesuits are, all, of course, all over the world. There's Jesuit universities, just like there are uh, Franciscan and uh, Dominican universities. So you know, Catholics have their factions, just like we do, right? <laughs> Franciscans, Dominicans, Jesuits. Sometimes Jesuits and Dominicans don't get along with each other or whatever, or they are kind of competitive. Who's really the smartest, best, and purest, you know? I'm trying to remember, I think the very first... Catholic University in America is Georgetown, and I think it's a Jesuit university. So good things are happening such that the Catholic Church we encounter today is not the same Catholic Church of the medieval period that Luther is objecting to. Uh, in many ways, it changed itself as a result of the Reformation. So the Counter-Reformation, well, they call it the Catholic Reformation. Protestants call it the Counter-Reformation, like the Catholic response. Uh, in some ways, Catholicism comes out better as a result of the Protestant Reformation. Um, but as long as church and state are connected, there's going to be religious wars. And the period following the Reformation sees lots of religious wars between Catholics and Protestants throughout Europe. Uh, but that's a subject for next time. All right, I think that's going to be enough for today. Unless you have any like questions or... Uh, 
anything you want to talk about. Okay, uh, thank you guys. We'll, we will be getting more into American church history over the next couple of weeks. Um, so for those of you who are American history buffs might like learning more about that. We'll do first, second grade awakening, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, you know, fun stuff.